Hi, I'm Emily Roger, host of the Boiling Point Podcast. My co-host, Dave Vale, and I will bring you thoughtful discussions with leaders who are positively impacting our world. This is The Boiling Point, where leadership and inspiration meet. Hey, Emily. Hello, Dave Vale. Long time. <laughs> yeah. Well, since yesterday. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah. We did a run through the tech works. Um, I shouldn't have said that because that, that'll jinx it right there. Um, but uh, it was more my tech that we're, 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 we generally are worried about than than, any, than your tech. Um, but that was, yeah, it was good to catch up with you yesterday. And, you know, for the listeners, you know, we, we generally have this. I have a question. It was like, where, where has Emily been lately? And I think the last, every time I ask you this question, you come, you know, you some exotic place, but the last trip, pretty amazing. So maybe you can give just a quick highlight of, of, uh, you know, what, what you've been doing over the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've spent the last um, five weeks over in Africa, was filming a documentary there around um, sustainable travel and conservation. So with wildlife and with fly fishing and community involvement. And so was in South Africa and Lesotho and Botswana and Gabon. And so did a, a couple of weeks at a safari and then a couple of weeks fly fishing. And then I spent my Christmas doing a gorilla trek, which was a, uh, that's not a part of the documentary. That was just something that I have always wanted to do since watching Gorillas in the Mist way back in, I think, 1987. So it was kind of fulfilling a, uh, a lifelong childhood dream and just had such a fantastic time. And, um, just, yeah, it's still all slowly kind of settling in. It feels quite surreal, but I think that the most beautiful thing is that it was captured on film. And so the rest of the world and all the Boiling Point listeners um, will be able to see some of the things that we captured while there. I can't wait. And I, I actually found it interesting that you had told you had said this prior to going that you did not want the cameras on the gorilla uh, portion. And the reason for that was? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think that there's certain things in life that we just need to fully experience on our own. And um, I took a few photos and videos like while I was in with the gorillas, like kind of amongst them, um, but not too much because I think that so often it, um, yeah, I just didn't want anything to take away from an experience that was just um, really important for me. And um, I'm glad that it went that way. And it was just um, just a beautiful, really special moment. And it was so fascinating to see this gorilla family that had like eight or nine gorillas in it. And just the family dynamics amongst them was hilarious. I'm like, <laughs> everything else now makes sense. Like, no wonder humans are the way that they are. Like, there yeah. was like, Little oh, boys in the background, like getting into mischief, and this like one kind of teenage girl that was like too good to talk to anybody. And <laughs> were you were you hanging out with my family? <laughs> yeah, for, yeah, yeah. I was actually. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious. Oh my gosh. Well, I look forward to hearing more. Um, let's let's move on because I don't have anything nearly as exciting to say over the last five weeks, other than getting a little sick, taking a trip to Halifax. Um, but I did spend some great time with family. So that was, that was awesome. And nice. you can't, I don't, you know, I don't want to downplay that, uh, but nothing as exotic as uh, traveling to Africa, but I, I look forward to getting more information and, and actually, you know, seeing this um, documentary, it'd be really cool. So let's welcome our guest. We're going to bring in Andrew Olin and we're doing this a little different. There's Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Dave. Hi, Emily. Hi, Andrew. Welcome to The Boiling Point. Thank you very much. It's great to be on The Boiling Point. Happy to have you. And so what we're doing, Andrew, a little bit different. I'm going to do a, a quick intro of you, and then you're going to tell me if I got it right or what, what I missed and, um, and add to it, if that's okay. Um, so I'll start with Andrew is the president and CEO of Canada's Moosehead Breweries. Um, it's independently owned and family run. Uh, and but what we really want to dig into that because that's I find that fascinating. He serves on numerous boards, including Enterprise St. John, 
Beer Canada, which I'd love to learn more about Beer Canada um, as, a, as a big beer fan myself. Um, Atlantic Institute for Market Studies, Tech Canada. Uh, he became the president of Moosehead Breweries in 2008 and has been the CEO since 2013. Is that factually correct? Yes, uh, that's, uh, that's factually correct. Just a little bit of a uh, history for your listeners in terms of yes. Moosehead Breweries. Yes, uh, please. In 1865, uh, Susanna Oland, who would be my great, great, great grandmother, she moved from England to Halifax, Nova Scotia with her nine children. And uh, her husband, John, had gone on to Halifax a year ahead. And uh, they were looking for a way to start to live the Canadian dream. And Susanna was a, a brewer in England. They were able to secure some funding, started a brewery in 1867, the same year we became a country. A couple of years later, John, her husband, died. Uh, they didn't have the whole thing papered as well as they should have. Susanna actually lost the brewery, continued to, to work at the brewery and brew the beer, was able to buy the business back a few years later. Uh, and here we are, you know, 156 years later, uh, we are uh, the largest uh, independent brewery in Canada, largest brewery owned by Canadians. And uh, the brewery is run by uh, my brother, Patrick, our CFO and myself, and then a great management and leadership team. Wow. Okay, Andrew, this story just got way more interesting. Okay. <laughs> yeah, on. no, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I, it, it, I can, I can go through it, but essentially at every generation, they had like either a big decision or a big event, uh, including, you know, the Halifax explosion, some largest man-made explosion prior to the nuclear bombs of World War II. Uh, my grandfather literally went to war for three years during World War II. Uh, my, we are headquartered in St. John, New Brunswick. You know, my father in the early sixties, he went to one of these classic sort of border trade type dinners. And there was a sign behind the speaker that said export or die. And, uh, that was the inspiration for us to expand outside of Atlantic Canada. And because of some rules in Canada, we're starting regarding selling beverage alcohol. We were actually selling beer in the United States before we were selling beer outside of Atlantic Canada. <laughs> the way it, uh, way it works, so it's a it's a it's a really fun business, a challenging business, and uh, look forward to uh, sharing more with you. Well, thank you for that. That's that's so important. I'm glad you dug it because the family history is is rich. I've heard some of it before. Well, actually, one question I have is I and we I was talking to a brewer. And she was telling me that um, originally it, women were the brewers. Like, so your 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 great 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 grandmother Susanna, like that was more commonplace. Is that is that is that? Yeah, how? that's 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 true. Uh, I mean, if you if you think back to to history through uh, through the Middle Ages and just before, uh, everyone drank beer, and the reason was because, particularly in Europe, the water just wasn't safe. Like the, the water would kill you. It was so contaminated. And one of the things that happens with beer is that beer has to be boiled. And so, uh, so literally, uh, young children would go from being nursed to drinking sort of a very light uh, <laughs> alcohol beer, but which would have uh, the nutrition nutrition element that beer has. And then just beer became, uh, yeah, that was what it was like 13th, 14th, 15th century throughout Europe. Incredible. Emily, I know you got a whole bunch of questions. Right? I, I know this is where it's like, okay, Emily, don't take over the entire yeah. conversation. <laughs> take over, take over. Don't no, but you did, Dave. You asked my question around um, of it being predominantly women that were brewers. Is that still the case, or I would say that um, no. So what would have happened is that. Uh, for probably the last hundred odd years, the brewing industry was uh, was a male dominated industry, as most and many industries were. Uh, but then I think in the last 20 years or so, we've started to see a lot more uh, a lot more women get into the beer business and, and get into it, get into brewing. Hmm. 
so so how many generations are you is it now with you and patrick like what what generation are you yeah so patrick and i are generation six wow my father derek's obviously generation five and then uh all of them, I have three adult children, so they've all worked in the brewery uh, summer positions. Uh, two of Patrick's uh, children have. So we've got multiple members of Generation 7 that um, have worked in, in the brewery. And, and, and I think two things, though. First of all, uh, my father, Derek, who's 84, um, he has a great expression, nose in, hands out. So he wants to know what's going on, but he's lets Patrick and I run, run the business. And then in terms of the whole transition succession planning, uh, we have a rule in the family, which came from my father, that you have to work outside the business before you go into the business. So you can do, do whatever you're going to do, sort of um, post-secondary education, go somewhere else, learn, make some mistakes, get some good experience. Uh, and then if it's a fit for both parties, both the, the business and the individual, uh, there may be opportunities to join the business. So it's like it's not a foregone conclusion. Definitely not. Definitely not. I mean, if you think, uh, you know, every uh, every group of five year old hockey players on the ice, their parents are like, oh, my Johnny's going to play in the NHL. Right. Well, yeah. just, we know what that's. Right. And, uh, you know, business is. Uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good fit for some people. It's not for others. And in particular, I'll call it senior leadership roles are, uh, are a good fit for some, but they may not be for all. And mm -hmm. the individuals need to take the time uh, to figure that out for themselves. And so what was your journey, Andrew? So my journey is after, after university, um, the only place I knew I wasn't going to go work was Moosehead. So uh, I, I looked around, I was living in Halifax at the time, and I ended up working at a shipyard in Halifax as a management trainee, did that for a couple of years. It was, it was just a lovely way to be exposed to everything from the production side of the business, sales side, um, the finance side, uh, labor relations. So it was really good experience. Uh, and then I actually uh, was involved in the construction of a tugboat there, which Last time I was in Halifax, it's still, still, it hasn't sunk yet. So that's a good sign. Mm -hmm. uh, and then came to Moosehead in 1993, uh, started in our, uh, in the, what we call our packaging departments. So that's where we actually put the beer in the bottles and the bottles in the case, and then spent some time in brewing. Then I wanted to make a transition from uh, the, production side of the business to what we call the commercial side, which is sales and marketing. So we went back to school, did an MBA. And then after that, I had a, a series of roles, in both sales uh, and marketing. And then uh, I was uh, sitting in my office in December of 2007. And uh, my father's assistant called me up and said, your father would like to see you in, in his office. And, a little unusual that he would want to see me. So I went down uh, and he said, you know, the gentleman who's uh, current president has just resigned and we'd like you to be the next president. And my immediate thought was, don't say anything, get out of the room as quickly as you can. They may change your mind if you say something stupid. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, so it, it definitely, I, I, it was, it was, it was a touch earlier than sort of uh, I, I was expected, but, you know, these things that there's, there's no perfect timing. And uh, so it's been, uh, it's been a, an interesting run since. Is there, is there like a certain amount of pressure that comes along with that? Like when you, you know, you, you know, you were um, after, you know, you, you have that meeting with your father, you recognize that, wow, it's, you know, that I'm going to be carrying the mantle here, you know, with my brother. Yeah. I guess you wouldn't have known at that time. I don't know if Pat or Patrick's role was at that point, but I'm just, I'm just trying to get a sense of like, like that's a, that's a big um, commitment and, and ask given, you know, six, you know, being the sixth generation and the legacy and all those sorts of things. Yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 no different than the pressure that anyone else has to 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 perform and to do a, a job well. Um, you know, you can't go into uh, into a role thinking, okay, 
I just can't screw this up. I just, you know, I can't, that's not how you approach things. Um, and, uh, but I think in most people's cases, and certainly in my case, you know, pressure is part of the motivation, right? Mm. It's what, it's what makes you, you know, what makes you work hard, what makes you grind through, uh, and, it, and over time, uh, you develop resilience and, uh, and you get stronger and better outcomes. What would the most, um, or some of the most valuable lessons for you have been when you look back now and even look at like working in the shipyard or for the tugboat of lessons that you learned outside of Moosehead breweries that you were really able to bring into your current position now? Yeah, I think that um, what I learned before I came in um, is that in many ways, um, all businesses have so many similarities in terms of a team working together, trying to develop a, you know, a, a common objective and then, and then execute on, on, uh, on that objective. Uh, I think my shipyard experience, the, the, the biggest learning there was just how much practical information, knowledge and ideas that the frontline workers have. And the, and the and the tremendous opportunity when you can tap in to to the folks who are closest to the work or or doing really doing the work. Uh, I'm curious about what you how, like, and I've um, you know I guess had the luxury of seeing you in a group of of leaders, and and uh, I'm curious about how you describe your leadership style. Um. Well, my leadership style is still evolving, um, but I would say that my leadership style is um, I try to be uh, collaborative. Um, I'm working to provide with the team, but ultimately myself to provide more clarity uh, to the organization. Um, and I believe the best leaders ask really, really good questions. And that's something that I've been challenging myself on. Uh, if I had sort of a do over Andrew today versus Andrew 2008, um, I've learned the hard way it's, it's fine to say, um, I don't know the answer. Um, and maybe it's not even my job to find out the answer. Maybe it's, it's, it's your job. And so it's more about what are those questions we should be, uh, I should be asking, we should be asking ourselves as opposed to immediately going into solution mode. Well, you're, you're, uh, you're speaking to two, two coaches. So we appreciate that, Andrew. And I hope people are listening to what Andrew's saying related to the value of asking really good questions and not coming in with the solution. Um, I, you got I an A plus on your answer, Andrew. As soon yeah. as you said that your that your leadership style was ever evolving, it was like yeah. I had my checklist. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, and it's and it's and that there's a humility about that that is really appreciated, right? Because um, and and you know, and a confidence too, Andrew. Like from my perspective, sitting on the outside, I mean, that not everyone says answers this question that way. You know, it was, I, I was I was just thinking about this over the weekend, because I knew I was going to be um, on this podcast. And I, I thought I'd tell this story as uh, we all remember COVID. And for me, COVID started in uh, the night the NBA shut down. And then I was at an offsite meeting on the Thursday, came back to the office on the Friday. There was lots going on. I can remember one of my children called me in the afternoon of Friday and said, their office has sent everyone home. And I remember thinking, wow, they're sort of overreacting. And then we um, we ended up, as everyone else did, sending everyone home we could on, on the Monday. But yet we were still um, functioning, brewing beer, packaging beer, doing all that type of stuff. But if you remember at the time, people were talking like COVID, we need a two week cir circuit breaker. We just need to slow things down for a while. And that weekend, uh, I spent a lot of time online just reading, and I read a lot of Bill Gates stuff. 
And um, he, his message was, look, this, this could be years and you have to prepare for that. And I can tell you, I was not in that frame of mind uh, when that weekend began. And I can remember coming back first thing Monday morning when we had our whatever 9 a.m. call with my senior team. And I just said to them, look, we have to think about this differently. We have to be prepared that this could go for, for years. And I'm, I'm a little bit of embarrassed of how I might have how I acted the first week in terms of being a, not a COVID denier, but just not fully understanding it. Yeah. Uh, and then fortunate, I was uh, I was intuitive enough to go and try to get some perspective from some other folks who were who were more up to date with what's going on with pandemics, and and that was that was fundamental for us in terms of just dealing with COVID. Well, it was it was such a a weird time. Like even for you to bring us back to that, like it's you know it's it's, it's reminding me of, and it was, I mean, just so many unknowns, and and I, I listen, I I can relate because I thought. Oh, this will be a nice two-week break, and then we'll get back to it, right? And then after that two weeks, I don't know. For for me, it became, oh my goodness, like this this isn't good. Like <laughs> then it became, how do I how do we make sure we survive this as as a business? You know? Yeah. Oh yeah. No, that that was. I mean, I had that sort of one week of you know we're going to be back soon, and then it was really that Bill Gates stuff that just yeah. reinforced like. This is the new normal, and we have to assume this is the the new normal uh, going uh, going forward. So, uh, so we're always learning. We're always le- we're always learning. I love your concept around the nose in, hands out, and what a simple four word thing that holds such great impact. And you know, with that, I'm curious of like obviously, like you are someone who was very introspective when you look at your leadership styles and being the CEO, what are like the tendencies where you have to catch yourself or are there where you want to be hands in, nose out? <laughs> oh, that's, that's a great question, Emily. So, I mean, the, 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 uh, the first one is like, I've never been afraid to make a decision. I love making decisions, right? So I can, uh, whether it's my personal life or, or business life, let's let's make the decision. We can we can talk about it later. Let's make the decision first. So, really, sort of slowing down um, and 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 taking the time, whether it's smaller decisions or bigger decisions. Um, and then the second would be uh, I've learned, you know, I need to speak last or I need to speak later, mm. and that. Even if I think my comments are, are, um, are perhaps say, setting up a conversation or relatively minor, they can influence the conversation. And, and what I don't want is I don't want people to see that I'm going this way. Okay, okay, we all got to go that way because really the, the most value is when uh, you, can, you can have all of the different perspectives. And so what I've tried to do with questions, and it's still very much a work in progress, is, okay, let's put some questions on the table that really force us just to think about this in a mm-hmm. different way. So if we did this and it didn't work, what, what would that, why would that be? Mm. Would, our, would our competitors want us to make this decision? What decision would our competitors not want us uh, to, to? If we made this decision, what's the worst thing that could, could happen, and uh, and that takes that takes the discipline of giving yourself time, and that's something that uh, I like to be busy, and so I, I'm I'm still a work in progress, but I've learned that uh, you have to you have to take the appropriate time to get some stuff done. Actually, that's a really nice segue into um, we got a little cheat sheet here. And I, I remember hearing your father say this. I believe it was Derek said this. Um, I don't want to be the biggest. I just want to be around the longest. Um, how does that, I guess, resonate? And or I mean, how does that adjust how you would be leading if you know if in fact that's a statement you're you're you know kind of built around? Yeah. No. It's it's a statement that you know fathers made for many very many years, and that. You know, my brother and I uh, firmly embrace. I mean, I think um, the uh, if, if some of your 
uh, listeners may have heard Simon Sinek talk, and he talks about you know a finite game and an infinite game. Right. And and really, you know, this statement is all about just we're playing an infinite game here. Yes, we measure ourselves from time to time, but ultimately, it's just how do we get better, sort of each and every day, every quarter, every year across a broad spectrum of, of measurements uh, so that we're uh, so that we're a more successful business and set up for long term uh, long term success. And uh, and that's, you know, the inspiration for my father. And that's what we try to do here every day. Mm. I love the self-awareness that you have about knowing that you just love to make a decision. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's, uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's, 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 you know, we all have our, uh, we all have our, the way we're wired and I, I'm, I'm, I have a confidence. So I'm, 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 uh, I'm prepared to, uh, to suffer the, uh, I'll call it the, 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 the risk reward in terms of a wrong decision, whether you're in a foreign city and it's where we're going for supper. Oh, that looks good. Let's go there. Why would we take the time to read the review on Google? It looks good. Like, let's just go in there. Right. So, yeah. Um, and it's, uh, and, and I, I, I'm sure a little bit of it is a sort of a bit of a dopamine rush from just you know, making decision, getting something done, going on to the, going on to the next one. What are like, so if you think, um, of your tenure, like what are the, I guess maybe the, the, the most important decisions you've made or been part of making, or, you know, or the businesses made with your leadership, um, you know, to be, to be still relevant in 2024. Cause I'm guessing yeah. there's points in time where, you know, you, you guys would have had to make some serious adjustments based on the market conditions. And, you know, you've got probably real, I mean, you've got very strong competition out there and people flooding the market with all these, the craft, you know, brewery industry. And I just can imagine all the forces. And you mentioned like the provincial challenges you know and just getting across provincial borders and you know there's i mean there's no lack of challenges in your business yeah so i think that um the the first thing was just change is coming and then after that we're going to have more change and then after that more change i think if i reflect back on 2008 um there was an there was an element of well, why can't we just go back to the way it used to be? Uh, why, 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 why do we have to operate this way? Why, uh, why is this happening, or why is that happening? And so, um, across a without getting the specifics, across a lot of different spectrums of, of the business. So, you know, part of that is is then talking and being very, and you have to be quite vocal about this is just the reality and trying to connect um uh folks with uh you know if you think about the realities in their life at the time and how things were changing and how that applies to to uh to our business and then from there you know you have to figure out which people are going to be able to join you on that journey of change and improvement hmm. uh because you know some uh some are challenged by that um, and you, you need to give people the appropriate amount of time, but not too much time. Uh, so there was, you know, there was, there was definitely, um, some transition, uh, some transition there. And then I, when I came in, um, I personally made a big commitment to safety in the organization. Uh, I thought it was one just vitally important for 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 the reason first of all it's it's morally the right thing but also just the safer you are as an organization the better you're going to perform it's you know, less accidents you're doing things right the first way mm -hmm. and um and it was it was a way of, of 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 challenging the organization to think to think differently and so i'm very pr proud of that that safety journey um and then from there it became okay now that we've sort of we've accepted change we're on the safety journey what how do we just create this culture of improvement that we're uh where we're just it's not that we're never satisfied it's just we're always looking at the biggest opportunities and how do we address that opportunity and and then more forward 
and then wrapping it all around that is uh, is our consumer. And and often in business, uh, we get the consumer and the customer mixed up. The consumer mm -hmm. is the end user. Mm -hmm. You buy the product typically through a customer, but the consumer, if particularly if you're consumer packaged goods such as beer, so you go to a retailer or a bar, you buy that's the customer, and the consumer buys it from them, and so. Uh, we need to meet the needs of our customers, but ultimately it's our, it's our consumers. The stronger our brands are um, uh, and the more consumer pull we have, the, the better we'll all be. So that, that, would, be the, that would be sort of the, 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 the big, if I look back over the last uh, 15, 16 years, sort of the, the, uh, the big changes that we as a team uh, attacked and implemented. Yeah, and it's almost like cultural change. I'm hearing. You know, you had to had to address you know some things that needed to be shifted in the culture. I'm guessing. Yeah, I mean, I think that if in many family businesses, if you go back 30, 40, 50 years, there was an element of uh, we won't tell you, so you don't have to worry. <laughs> yeah. <Right>? Yeah. <laughs> How's the business? I don't, you know, doesn't, doesn't, you know, we're not going to tell you financials. We're not going to talk about things because we don't talk about that. But the, the, the corollary of that is, okay, well, you just come to work and do your thing. And you just can't run a business like that in, uh, in the, in the 21st century. So, um, so we've been much more, uh, much more open in terms of telling our employees and all of our employees in terms of performance, um, and uh, you know, what's working well, uh, what's what's not, and uh, again, that's that's a journey because there's a there's an educational component to that. Um, you know, there's there's many people who they deal with you know, revenue, they deal with the increases, diff decreases in. Uh, in costs or in revenue as part of their business, but there's others who don't, you know, they're coming in and they just, they have a specific area, whether it could be IT, whether it could be production. And so uh, lots of effort in terms of increasing uh, business acumen across the entire uh, workforce. I think too, in listening to you speak about um, the change, which was the first one that you brought up and, in that I hear that like you, you as a leader teach people how to navigate the small changes so that when the bigger changes come, they are more manageable. And it's like that we, yeah, I mean, we need to kind of learn how to ride the small waves first before we ride the big ones. But how much are we actually paying attention to those small waves and those small changes to be really able to learn about ourselves, our companies, our organizations? to be able to successfully navigate the bigger things. Exactly. And, and, and having that, that self-awareness and that confidence, um, oh, wow, that's a competitor. They're doing something different. <laughs> well, that looks stupid. That's, that's not the response, right? The response is, well, they're pretty bright people. I wonder what they know that we don't know or that they've, and then on the bigger stuff, uh, I was I was very fortunate to have a mentor, and he had he just had an expression he called it the brutal facts. Mm -hmm. And and so often in business, oh, it's gonna get better next year, <laughs> or you know, this you know, a certain employee that they're all of a sudden they're gonna act differently, or this you know it's 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 most likely not gonna happen. It's just it's the it's the reality. Uh, of, of the situation. So you have to take the time uh, to be comfortable and, 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 and address that and, uh, and then figure out how you're going to react to that uh, in, a, in a manner so that you can, uh, you can grow and you can win. But it's, it's, it's challenging because, and, and we all do it, it's, there's a comfort zone with where we are today. And, uh, and moving, uh, and moving in a, to something that is that is unknown, uh, and, and I think the world we're living in today is just there's there's so the, the pace of change is just so much quicker, 
Uh, and just because it worked five, 10 years ago doesn't mean uh, it's working today and certainly isn't going to work tomorrow. Yeah. No true words were said. <laughs> it's so true. Um, you both have something in common that you may, you, know, you may or may not be aware of, and that is that you both emceed uh, a L'Arche event. Cool. And uh, I think that's pretty cool. I was just yeah. thinking about that. It just kind of came to me that I believe the first one uh, that was that Frank McKenna was speaking at was you, Andrew. Is that am I am I wrong in saying? Yeah, that? no. The, the folks in St. John uh, they asked me to to get involved, and I I was uh, I was honored to. And it's to me, Larsh is just it's a great example of community, mm -hmm. and it's, it's a great example of I would say community at its best. And uh, and giving some folks who perhaps don't you know are uh, don't have all the advantages that some people have to still to to live fulfilling uh, lives and uh, I've certainly gotten a lot more out of Larsh than uh, I've given to Larsh. It's been, mm. it's been very very valuable, very valuable. Yeah, maybe we'll co MC next year, Andrew. That would be great, Emily. That would be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and one of the things, just to speak on Larsh for for a moment, um, because um, the the other speaker at that uh, event was a gentleman named uh, Martin Chesson, who's a buddy of mine, and and I and, and you know, I've known him for many years. He's had a, uh, a now an adult son with intellectual difficulties, and the challenge becomes is what happens to that individual mm -hmm. when the parents die. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, you know, and or as the parents age and um, and so Lars has just done an amazing job of, of being able to uh, transition, uh, you know, those young adults into into a meaningful life experience, which just uh, as a parent uh, just must be so relieving. That, uh, that that is is taken care of because obviously we're, none of us are going to be here forever. No, oh, unfortunately, no. And, and Martin was uh, was actually on this podcast a number of years ago, sharing sharing it. And what was wonderful about he just speaks from the heart, doesn't he? Yeah. Like he just it was uh, yeah. And I I appreciate you bringing that up because uh, you know there's a leader, right? And um, you know he. And he was an executive with Xerox. He brought the contact centers into Atlanta, Canada. He's just done some amazing things. So Martin is just an amazing individual uh, for sure. But it kind of leads me to like this idea of giving back. So that's obviously really important to you. Yeah. I mean, I think that um, all of us who are in a position to give back um, and the more you're in a position to give back, the more you should give back one way or another. But I also, and I, I talk particularly to uh, to our younger employees here at Moosehead. I mean, getting involved in in volunteer and not for profit, it's a it's just an amazing way to develop your skill set, to be exposed to different leaders, um, to to be to be challenged, and so. Yes, obviously it's giving back, but you can you can also get something out of it, particularly early in your career. And I, I can assure you, I've I've gotten back a lot more from everything that I've been involved in than than I've given. Just tremendous experiences, tremendous friendships. Hmm. Uh, I was, uh, I think, as, as I spoke to at the beginning, I grew up in Halifax. And 1993, moved from Halifax to St. John with my young family. And St. John's a relatively small place. Moose says relatively high profile. So it's sort of everyone knows Andrew and Andrew doesn't know anyone. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was talking to someone at Moosehead and they suggested I get involved with the St. John Board of Trade. And it was just a lovely experience. Uh, I have an interest in that, that type of call it policy side of things. So I, I enjoyed the discussion and the work, but it just enabled me to create a, a, a strong network here. And then because of that, you want to grow the network. And uh, um, particularly when you move to a new, uh, at any time, but really, if you move to a new community, if you can figure out a way to get involved somehow in, in volunteering, it's very, very helpful. 
Yeah. And I, I love hearing you say about how um, that you've given, that you've received more back from Larsh than what you have given. And I think that in giving in general, whether it is monetary, our time, compassion, like we do always end up receiving more. Oh, yeah. 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 Just, yeah. Just, just, um, yeah. I mean, the reality is, yeah. Everyone Do you agree call, with that? Do you agree with that, Andrew? Yep. I don't know. <laughs> Everyone in this call, but but just you know, most of us, we have what we need. Yeah, sure, you, you know, but we have what we need, right? So um, the opportunity to have these experiences is is it's you know really money can't buy them, sure. and but you have to you have to stick your neck out there. Yeah, mm -hmm. you have to challenge yourself, uh, and it's. It's it's sometimes when we talk about a lot of moosehead, you know, you talk about how difficult it's to run a marathon. Running a marathon is not the hard part. The hard part is the first time you decide you're gonna go out and run and walk for 10 minutes just to start that journey, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. The last step of the marathon, that's you know, people are cheering, that's easy. It's when you first go out Saturday morning at 7 a.m. and 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 I think that's um, if there's one message I could give to folks is just the, the value of just putting yourself out there and, uh, and challenging people to, to, there are lots of organizations out there that are looking for, uh, for people to help out. Mm, yeah. Dave, what I thought you were going to mention as the similarity was, um, cause I know that Andrew is a cyclist. Yeah. Well that, that there's that too. And, and I was also, I mean, I want to dive into the like chat about beer topic. Yeah. Um, obviously you drink the beer, you don't just like produce it and market it and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Beer is, uh, and beer is the, uh, third most popular beverage in the world. Get after, out. Yeah, after water and tea. Oh, he number two, I guess yeah. so. Yeah. Wow. He is, um, and I'm biased. I'm a firm believer that uh, moderate consumption of beer is part of a healthy lifestyle. Uh, there is no fat in beer. Um, they're on a per, per milliliter or ounce base. There's more calories in skim milk than there are in a glass of, of beer. So I'm, I'm a firm believer that that beer could be part of a healthy lifestyle, but it's like everything else. It has to be in moderation and it has to be in conjunction with uh, you know, proper diet and exercise. Um, exercise is a, is a big part of my life. Uh, one, I like it. Two, um, in order to function, to perform, I need to sleep. I'm not one of these people who can go and go on five hours a night. I need seven, eight, seven, seven, seven and a half hours of sleep every night. Um, and we all have stress in our lives and exercise is part of how I get rid of the stress, helps the sleep. And then, and I, um, I used to run a little bit, or not a little bit, a fair amount. I just found as I got into my late thirties that uh, it's a lot of pounding on the joints and, uh, that's when I moved over to cycling and, uh, I, I really, really enjoy cycling. It's something you can do as a group, something you can do on your own. Um, I can do it indoors. I can do it outside. Uh, it's, 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 it's one of the lovely parts of my life would be cycling. Well, Emily will totally agree with that. <laughs> yep. It's definitely up there. Yeah. So what's your favorite beer, Andrew? Any one that we make and you're buying. No. Just... <laughs> There's the businessman uh, we've been uh, looking yeah. for. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, um, I mean, our, our uh, um, so what I would do is I, I am going to get to an answer here, but I <laughs> yeah. purposely, I cycle through all of our beers on a regular basis because I want to be making sure that, uh, that the, uh, that the quality and the, and the taste is consistent with what I, uh, wh where we should be. I also drink, uh, my competitors beer on a regular basis, 
Now, you're not going to find me in St. John, New Brunswick, ordering a Bud Light at the local bar. That's not going to happen. You don't have to worry about that. <laughs> but I, I will over, I will figure out a way. Um, and I, I, I predominantly uh, 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 drink beer. Um, I think my my favorite beer is 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 Alpine Lager, which is more of an East Coast beer. Um, it was created in 1937 by my grandfather Philip Oland. Hmm. Um, and there's an interesting story here. Um, he had gone to brewing school. He'd been exposed to lager beers, which are use a different type of yeast, and they're lighter in ales, which are what uh, we had been brewing prior. My great grandfather was in Boston at the time having surgery and they were chatting on the phone. And my great grandfather said, uh, I, uh, I hear you have this new beer. Um, I look forward to trying it and perhaps, you know, we might even consider se selling it. That Philip, my grandfather paused and said, well, it's actually been on the market for about two weeks and it's doing rather well. So <laughs> to me, that sort of defines, you know, family businesses, like the, the next generation, they have to ask for the order a bit. Like you have to, you have to push things a bit. Yeah. It can't be obnoxious um, and, and, and reckless, but you, you do have to, you know, say it's look at some point, you know, this is most likely going to be mine, and and this is this is the di direction that that uh, we we uh, we need to go, and so. But I um, I love beer, and uh, and I love working for a brewery. It's re it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. I, I think that that description of your great grandfather and your grandfather is a total nose in uh, or uh, hands out, right? Like, I mean, isn't that the perfect example? Um, I, I'll I, I'm going to share just a. a, a a small story. I'm a big fan of Moosehead. I always buy Moosehead products. Uh, I love Crack Canoe. It's kind of the, it's my favorite. It's just nice and light, and it just it, well, it goes down too well actually. So the moderation piece is a little bit tricky, but it's only it's only three point five percent. So I always feel a little bit better about that. So we're having a big party, and I would typically buy a two four of of Crack Canoe or Moose Light as one of the things. And um, someone coming to a party, I won't name who it is, um, was a, is a big fan of Bud Light. So I, I thought, well, I should get some Bud Light. And we had some Crack Canoe already or whatever, Moose Light, I guess, at the time. And I was walking out of the liquor store. And who do I run into? But Patrick. Your brother. <laughs> it was a big thing. And I was I felt like I had to explain to him. I said, Patrick, like, I don't usually, like, Pat, like I was just trying to, like, I was so embarrassed, right? Like, was, like honestly, uh, you know, like, I felt like I had to explain. He just laughed and said, oh, you know, I'm like, no, no, but really, like, this is, this never happened. So I went to the party and I told everyone, I said, look, you guys, you guys really screwed me here, man. Because I, <laughs> so, <laughs> I am legitimately a huge fan and there's nothing as a New Brunswicker, I think is cooler than when I'm away somewhere and I inevitably see like a green bottle with the, the Moosehead sticker on it. It's a, it's, it's a weirdly proud thing as a New Brunswicker. Um, so I can only imagine what that like must feel like for you. Yeah, it, it really is. I mean, I, I, I had received a LinkedIn message this morning and it's a picture of Moosehead Rattler from Costa Rica. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. um, yeah, it's really yeah, it's 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 lovely, and I have endless stories of consumers, folks coming up to me and sending me images and things like that. And uh, that's what we're trying to do each day: just build more and more of of those. But it, it, Dave, your story of walking out of the liquor store is is is, <laughs> is cute, right? It's just yeah, and I think the the beer business does get in your it really really gets in your it gets in your blood and. Oh, yeah. uh, Probably the only one that's similar would be sort of the Coke versus Pepsi thing. Yeah, that's I. Uh, our vice president of sales and marketing, Trevor Grant, when I interviewed him, he was working for Pepsi, and we were. This was many years ago, and we were using a headhunter. We were, we were um, meeting at one of the head off headhunters just meeting rooms, and they put a selection of soft drinks on the table. And they were all Coke products. And I could just see Trevor's, like the steam coming out of his <laughs> what do I do? ears. And he was trying to focus as he had this can of Coke, like within arm's reach. And uh, that's, that's one of the reasons I hired Trevor, because I just saw that passion. It, it really gets in your blood.
uh, loyalty. That's awesome. Well, we're going to send you a Bud Light thank you package for being on the Boiling Point podcast. (laughs) Actually, you know, and there's one thing I want to comment on is this, if you have the, which you will, Emily, I'm certain you have the good fortune of, of interacting with the Moosehead group in any capacity. Um, they, they give you the best uh, speaker gifts, with, <laughs> like like all the swag and product and everything. And, and you know, you you like, I mean, for someone who's a big fan, it's like, this is the best. You know? <laughs> one, <laughs> like, one, like one fan at a time. time, one fan at a time. Oh man, it's so great. Yeah. Are you um, just sitting in like a moose head onesie when you're yeah. home? <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I was I was gonna wear some swag today and I thought, ah, it's going a little over the top. But uh but super big fan, Andrew. And um uh, I just I so enjoyed this conversation. Like it's just been a, like I really appreciate your um perspective and um humility in terms of sharing where you're at. I just think that's so valuable for other leaders to hear. And, um, you know, many thanks for, for joining us today. Um, I'm going to let Emily wrap it up because she'll have some, some wise thoughts, I'm sure. But um, you're always welcome to come back at any time. Uh, it's just been a real pleasure having you on. Thank you very much, Dave. Appreciate it. Yeah, ditto what Dave said. Andrew, I look forward to having the pleasure of meeting you in person um, and speaking for Moosehead so I can get my onesie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and oh i'll take a the a moosehead cycling kit that's what it'll be okay for my speaker gift sounds good <laughs> can sounds i request good. the swag yeah <laughs> not only not only am i telling you that you're bugging me as a speaker i'm requesting my swag <laughs> back <laughs> But Andrew, thank you so much. Your insights were so valuable. I know to me and so uh, the listeners as well. And um, so we will list all of Andrew's information and any extras we discussed today in the show notes and the best place to find all of that is on our website. We're active on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter, and we will put the video version on YouTube and Facebook. And of course, the podcast is available on all of your favorite podcast platforms. Thank you for listening. Follow or subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app or visit boilingpointpodcast.com for more.